कैन यू हियर मी यस ब्रदर या टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी द बुक ऑफ एक्लिसियास्टिस ओके देयर इज अ रीजन व्हाई वी आर लुकिंग एट इट and uh, it is in continuation with some of the things that we have been learning in the recent past okay uh, any idea who wrote this book i think those uh, it will not be a monologue i'll be opening it up for talk and discussion so you can unmute yourself and give reply other uh, king solomon king solomon brother king solomon okay very good सोलमन ने लिखा करके हमें कैसा पता है हाउ डू वी नो दैट इट वाज किंग सोलमन हु रोट इट एनी आईडी कुछ ज्ञान की ज्ञान की बात ही इसमें दी गई है ब्रदर ओके अबाउट विजडम एंड नॉलेज के बारे में काफी कुछ लिखा है ओके चैप्टर 1 वर्स 1 सेस आइडेंटिफाइज द ऑथर आई विल जस्ट रीड इट वर्ड्स ऑफ द टीचर सन ऑफ डेविड किंग इन जेरूशलेम ओके and one verse 16 uh, says he increased in wisdom more than anyone who ruled jerusalem okay chapter 12 verse 9 uh, says the teacher uh, uh, was wise he imparted knowledge to the people okay he pondered and set in order many proverbs okay just a couple of weeks back uh, on a sunday we looked at the temple which Uh, king solomon built in detail and we also saw his life we took a glimpse of uh, solomon's life okay so today we are going to look at a book uh, that king solomon wrote okay a strange book very strange so it is good we study it when we still remember uh, what we learnt about uh, king solomon okay uh, just as a recap uh, we saw that when david was dying uh, one of his sons adonija tried to uh, become king okay uh, but adonija was wanting to become king on his own he was not god's choice or god's appointed uh, king uh, god had not sent anyone to anoint him as king and uh, he was uh, not allowed Uh, to become king and king solomon uh, came uh, became ruler uh, instead okay uh, and we have seen in daniel chapter 4 that god is sovereign that anyone who rules on the earth can do so only with the express and divine permission authorization and uh, appointment by god okay so good or bad ruler they are there and solomon was also uh given the task of ruling israel uh the second thing we know about solomon which we had seen uh, two sundays back was that god gave him peace on all fronts okay his father's hand said shed much blood and there was lot of war and bloodshed and conquest and uh, rebellions and other things had to be uh, subdued uh, but when solomon came god gave him peace everything had been in control we had seen the significance of that also okay and very soon the third thing we saw was that solomon established his kingdom he eliminated all the opponents uh, whom david had named whom david had not eliminated uh, one by one he eliminated them uh, and uh, uh, then we also saw that god communicated in a dream uh, to uh, king solomon about the wisdom that uh, he had bestowed upon him okay uh, god gave him a dream in which he came to know about that and he used it uh, a lot uh, right through his reign uh, tributes flowed into his kingdom neighboring countries and even people from distant lands uh, came to visit king solomon and israel uh, because it was at its peak of glory and they brought tributes lot of money lot of gifts lot of spices lot of gold lot of silver lot of clothing many things came into the kingdom as a result of which okay then his fame spread and many foreign visitors kept coming including the queen of sheba about whom we uh, read in one kings okay then wealth prosperity and jobs came to everyone else okay all the people there was prosperity and development 
uh, of these people. Then uh, we also saw that silver was as common as stones in those days when King Solomon ruled. And gold from a place called Ophir had come and was very common. And cedars from Lebanon, Deodar wood, you know, uh, that was also very common. And the temple had plenty of cedar wood and uh, everything was coated with gold and uh, the entire kingdom had become wealthy. Then lastly, we had seen when we studied about Solomon's life was his fall, okay? Two reasons we saw chief of all. One was that uh, he brought his chariots from Egypt uh, against the command of God, where God had forbidden uh, Israelites from going back into Egypt, going back into their uh, old lifestyle, okay? And uh, he had forbidden them from having foreign wives. And Solomon married many foreign uh, women, okay? And uh, they were not followers of God. They ultimately uh, turned his heart away from God. And uh, he even started worshipping idols and uh, offering sacrifices to them. And it was uh, uh, the end of a man who had started beautifully in his life, in his young age. And uh, it was a tragic and a terrible end to a man who had so much potential, so much gifting, so much talent, so much abilities. And it was a tragic end. And remember that he was a man who had also built the most beautiful temple in which uh, the Israelites worshipped God. Okay. Uh, that was Solomon. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we are told uh, that uh, I, I'm talking about wisdom, you know, which Solomon had and which impressed people across the globe, okay? There was something about the disciples that impressed the hearers at that time uh, when the disciples walked here, okay? Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. They took note that they had been with Jesus. Okay. So, uh, though Solomon uh, had wisdom given to him, uh, unschooled fishermen became wise when they came in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Their association with the Lord uh, transformed people who were not educated. Solomon was an educated man, okay? But contact with the Lord Jesus Christ transformed uh, the disciples into people uh, who, uh, when anyone looked at them, they were astonished uh, at the wisdom and courage that they had simply because they associated with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? We also can take note of the fact that we were not wise by any standards of the world, okay? 1 Corinthians uh, talks about that. And uh, God chose the foolish things. God chose that which had no honor. And uh, like he uh, made us part of his kingdom, uh, and uh, he has set us apart and people will know us not because of our astonishing wisdom, but because of our association with the Lord Jesus Christ, which has given us a different kind of wisdom than the wisdom the world possesses. Okay. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gave generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you okay so the wisdom of solomon may have astonished his peers but uh, and people at that time but god has a plan for making every child of his wise okay wiser than the wisest around them okay and uh, it is something and if we lack it we recognize it we realize it James tells we need to pray to God who gives without asking, okay? And he gives without finding fault, okay? And it will be given to us when we ask uh, without doubting, okay? Uh, now, uh, when we think about successful people on the earth and we look at Solomon, King Solomon and his life, success is something that, uh, you know, he would communicate to anyone uh, what an ideal or successful person on earth would be like, okay? 
uh, he had money, he had power, uh, he had all the chariots, you know, the best transport of his time, and he could travel anywhere. Uh, he wanted huge palace, okay, and he had many servants, singers, and he had the best education, and more than that, God gave him wisdom, so he learned a lot of things which even uh, other people could not learn and understand. He had plenty of generation money to leave for uh, the next several generations, okay? And, uh, you know, he was uh, someone whom we would look at as successful, okay? In modern times, also people like Ambani's, Adani's, and, uh, you know, so many others who have plenty of money and wealth. Uh, Solomon was... Um, uh, not just comparable with all of them, but even astonishingly, perhaps much, much more wealthier and richer than all of them, okay? Uh, and he uh, was the author of at least uh, three books, okay? Song of Solomon, the book of Proverbs, and a large part of Proverbs was his contribution, and the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? They have the unique stamp of uh, King Solomon and uh, his writings. Perhaps the Song of Solomon was written when he was young. The book of Proverbs was assembled as he grew, as he administered as a king, and as he grew in age, you know, his experiences uh, in life were recorded in that. And the book of Ecclesiastes perhaps uh, is uh, something that King Solomon wrote uh, at the end of his life. You know, almost like how we sit in a car and look into the rear view mirror and a lot of things are passing by, you know, our past and all the things that we have done. So in a sense, uh, this book seems to be something that King Solomon wrote uh, towards the end as he looked at life, his life through the rear view uh, mirror, okay? Uh, there is one word uh, that is very common in the book of Ecclesiastes. Can someone tell me what is that word? Vain. Vain. Any other version? So Vanity. Meaningless. Van yeah. Vanity. Good. Vanity. Yeah. Okay. Yes, vanity. vanity. New Living tra Translations will use the word meaningless. Uh, King James, New King James, ESV, NASV, RSV, etc. use the word vanity. Uh, New English Bible uses the word emptiness. Okay, and there is a Hebrew word hebel, uh, which is translated as uh, one of these. Okay, they communicate basically the same thing, uh, the transient nature of things, the meaningless of things, the vanity of things. Okay, in other books of the Bible, the same word hebel is translated as a vapor or something which is fleeting or something which is quickly passing away. Okay. And therefore, like, you know, is not there to taste or enjoy or, or, be, or be of any significant use. Uh, the beauty of the uh, word is that King Solomon uses this 37 or 38 times, depending on which version of the Bible you are using, okay? Around 38 times he uses this word meaningless, okay? And... Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of life and imitate their faith. Okay. The Bible tells us, you know, very often we are very impressionable. We look at someone who is dynamic, someone who is impressive, someone who talks well, okay, someone who has everything in control, okay, and uh, we look at him. We see the way he dresses, we see the way he relates with people, we see the way he makes money, and uh, we see the way he gets along with different people, and we are impressed, okay? We look at a small fraction of a person's life, and we conclude in our hearts that this is what we should have been like, or this is what we should become like, okay? And then we worry about, you know, she, I'm not uh, what I ought to be. We feel discouraged, you know, that God didn't give us uh, that kind of a voice, that kind of a talk, that kind of a look, or that kind of money, or that kind of following. You know, something, it disappoints us. But the Bible tells us 
to remember your leaders people who have been with you okay and it says who spoke to you the word of god people who bring to you the word of god and uh, you are to consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith okay so when you want to uh, use a human being as an example then you need to look at the total life that he has lived okay it transiently people may impress you but when you look at the total life then you know like you know whether that lifestyle that was chosen by the man you chose to uh, imitate whether the outcome was good or bad okay and then the uh, bible exhorts us the writer to the hebrews exhorts us to imitate the faith of those whose end you know their outcome the total outcome of their life is impressive in a sense okay not that which was transient not to imitate that which was not there okay uh, in ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 13 this is what solomon writes better a wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to heed warning who no longer knows how to heed warning you know perhaps a thought about himself someone who started off well as a young man okay and someone who now when he was looking at the rear view uh, at his entire life which had passed you know he could look at himself as probably a foolish king who no longer knows how to heed warning you know i'm sure people if there were prophets who warned uh, king david there would have been prophets there would have been men of god there would have been good people who would have warned uh, solomon but solomon was not listening to many of it and uh, went the wrong way okay anyway the bible has is a very strange book and our god is also astonishingly different from what we are okay i'll just try to explain uh, this book and solomon's life gives us a good example uh, of that okay king solomon would have been excommunicated by most of the churches you know with 700 wives and 300 concubines you know most churches would not have even allowed him to take part in the table okay and if king solomon had written uh a book and brought it you know i am an editor of one small magazine community bus you know if something had been written by him and brought for being published perhaps it would have been rejected because of what uh, he was you know the kind of life that he was living also just imagine a manuscript being brought to you with 38 meaningless written in it you know how would you publish it in a magazine uh, that has to be read okay unreliable source meaningless content and we would have rejected it okay but god uh, didn't have didn't ask us he put what solomon wrote okay because he was uh, enabling solomon to put into words some things uh, which god wanted to communicate to us okay so uh, the book of solomon the song of solomon uh, ecclesiastes all these found their way into the canon approved writings you know which god chose uh, to express his word uh, in spite of uh, the kind of uh, vessel that he was and the kind of content that was there you know may not be easy to understand uh may raise eyebrows when you read it casually okay but they have strong content very useful very important for us uh in any way okay uh there are many new test uh, old testament uh, generally most of the old testament books will have some quotations in the new testament okay that means the new testament authors would have quoted some things from the old testament and that gives us proof that they considered that as scriptures or jesus would have spoken some quotation from the old testament book okay there are 10 old testament books which are not quoted in the new okay you can find out which of those uh, books are there okay that can be an 
exper uh, what to say uh, an assignment for you but anyway two of solomon's writings song of solomon and ecclesiastes they have no quotations in the new testament okay but the principles that are recorded in both these books uh, they are there in the established teaching of the new testament okay they they may not be quoted directly but they are indirectly alluded or referred to because the same principles are taught in that okay so we need not worry also because there are many people who try to communicate that these books should not have been part of the old testament canon but we know that uh, there is no content which is contrary to the scriptures okay in ecclesiastes 11 1 we are told that you reap what you sow and this is exactly what galatians 6 7 says uh, avoid youthful lust chapter 11 verse 10 says this is the content of 2 timothy chapter 2 verse 22 as well death is a divine appointment ecclesiastes 3 2 says this is the same which is mentioned in hebrews 92 okay love of money is evil uh, ecclesiastes 510 says this is same mention in 1 timothy 610 and about long prayers and long talks we have told uh, about the meaningless of it in chapter 5 verse 2 of ecclesiastes and same is reflected in matthew chapter 6 verse Seven. Okay. So uh, though uh, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon may not have been quoted directly verbatim, there are many truths that are written in these books which find reflection and uh, endorsement in uh, the writings in the New Testament as well. Okay. There are some things which. Uh, Uh, we must understand when we read the book of ecclesiastes uh, it is king solomon's perspective of life okay as he saw it at various phases in his uh, journey uh, on earth each of us also go through a journey like that a journey where uh, we try many things we are zealous we are excited and uh, then we discourage we get discouraged we give exams we fail or we get low marks then we get discouraged we think about the meaninglessness of all that then we start working and then again there is discouragement when we don't get the increment we don't get appreciation we don't uh, get the salary we deserve okay so many things ups and downs ups and downs ups and downs okay king solomon put everything in words money was never short for him but yet his life was having full of ups and downs okay something uh, these days we have been listening to uh, one or two or even three testimonies a day you know on uh, youtube and one of the things that uh, commonly catches our mind is that uh, uh, the fact that something brings people to the lord and usually it is uh, the meaninglessness of life meaninglessness of the belief systems that they had the meaninglessness of their existence the meaninglessness of all the things that they were following and then suddenly they were confronted with the truth of the glorious gospel and that made the difference okay and uh, it changed their life it changed their destiny it changed the course of the way they looked at things the way they used their money the ways they used their home the way they faced death and persecution the way they suffered even bad health and uh, the trials and traumas they went through everything had a different perspective uh, after that point when they had to come face to face with meaninglessness okay so solomon uh, wants to arouse uh, the world through his writings about the meaninglessness of all the activities that are there under the sun okay when you leave god out of perspective from the things that you are doing then life is meaningless okay that is the gist of it and he uses his life it's almost like a testimony of solomon you know about how he realizes uh, the shallowness the emptiness of everything that is done under the sun so very quickly i will go through some of the things that gave him that brought him to that point in life when he concluded that all these efforts are futile transient meaningless vanity okay uh, 
the first thought that he has is about all the labor that is done under the sun the earth remains the same he says you know and that's the observation the sun rises the sun sets wind comes from the north then it comes from the south okay water falls uh, the the rain falls then streams are formed streams go to the sea sea say it evaporates and goes back and a cycle everything is uh, having a cycle they start they end they start they end and then they keep going on as cycles and uh, on the other side human beings are born and they die okay but the overall environment in which life and death life and death life and death is replicated is uh, common okay and when he thought about this whole thing no birth death and uh, having children and like next generation going through the whole process he considered that you know kya hai isme okay meaningless nothing is new under the sun verse 9 of uh, chapter 1 says uh, whatever has been will be okay abhi jo bhi hai wo aage bhi wohi hoga it was already there before our time also that is what verse 10 says nothing new so everything is just as it was from beginning till now okay and no one remembers past generations and no one will remember future generations also no one will remember you and me here on earth okay and uh, so why do we strive for significance and uh, meaning and all those things on the earth okay that is what solomon uh, disturbed uh, the mind of this author okay then the second thing uh, which gave him a sense of meaningless was the learnings or the sciences that he studied okay the meaninglessness of all the education that he had were right through my schooling right through my college days right till i finished my uh, major education okay every day i uh, thought of my studies as a big chore a difficulty okay you know what is the outcome what is going to come out of it ultimately even if we uh, get very good marks get a very good job finally we are going to die and leave everything behind and precisely that was the thought on solomon's mind also and he says in verse 13 he explored uh, wisdom he tried philosophy uh, he tried to understand the difference between wisdom madness and folly in verse 17 and uh, he all the study only brought grief and uh, sorrow to him verse 18 says okay uh, so uh, king solomon and his pursuit of wisdom and knowledge Uh, you know didn't bring him to any thing that was better in life okay then the third thing which disturbed him and made him think about the futility of uh, life was the pleasures that he thought would be good for this transient life okay in chapter 2 verse 3 says he tried wine he tried foolish things in verse 2 he says he tried laughter you know just being a jolly good fellow then he tried many projects in verse 4 he built houses vineyards gardens uh, orchards reservoirs he did many things he bought people he says in verse 7 then he bought singers he uh, in verse 8 he had herds flocks gold silver and in verse 8 he says he had a harem as well he acquired as many beautiful women as he could and then he looks back and says everything was meaningless okay so uh, one of the reasons why solomon is taking pains to write all this is uh, so that as christians we should not follow this kind of a life we don't get Uh, meaning in life by following this kind of vain living it's all vanity it's all meaningless if we try to acquire uh, all this okay uh, then uh, in in the new testament we are also told about how many people have pierced their uh, in in search for riches have pierced their heart with grief okay so none of these things that the world offers can bring true joy true uh, 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 fulfillment okay then uh, the next thing uh, that uh, solomon wants us to know is uh, the uh, wickedness that is prevalent on the earth in verse 16 of chapter 3 
and uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4 it talks about oppression and it talks about how justice and judgment where they should have been actually evil prevails you know our courts are corrupt our police system is corrupt your everything you go to any society you know any part any country in the world and you will find that so where good has to be found where people should get justice there they will be denied it and lot of evil and wickedness will be present okay it was there in king solomon's time it is there even today i saw a testimony a few days back of a man called kumar from tamil nadu okay he was born in a dalit home he said that you know right from his childhood his mother told him that they were subhuman okay and that's what every neighbor told them also they were less than the least they were less than animals okay and then suddenly one day somebody gave them a bible and then he looked in the bible and he came across genesis 127 where it says god uh, created man in his own image okay and suddenly he was shocked what is he being told by the world what is he being told by his mother okay and uh, he was attracted to this god i never had heard a testimony in the past when somebody got converted by reading genesis 127 but this was a beautiful example of a person who in the midst of oppression and being the oppressed he was able to find god okay so as long as he was oppressed as long as there were oppressors Uh, near him as long as he looked at only those things his life was meaningless devoid he even tried to commit suicide okay but when he got out of it when he looked at it from god's perspective things changed okay uh, so that is why uh, solomon says in chapter 4 verse 2 the dead are better off the still born are still better off because they didn't see the evil that is there on this earth okay but it's it's from this meaningless perspective a godless perspective that solomon is talking talking about then the next thing that he wants us to know is about the futility of all the toiling that we do on this earth you know this running around to jobs uh, this running around to get increments and promotions and other things okay and uh, it is all few futile he says in chapter 4 verse 6 better a handful than two handfuls with uh, better one handful with tranquility than two with toiling and chasing after the wind okay chasing after the wind is another slogan that he uses very often because there's nothing bahut paisa ke bhi kuch nahi rehta hai tumhare hath mein okay man without kids he talks about an example of a man without kids chapter 4 verse 8 okay what is he slaving for on this earth who will he leave it for why is he depriving himself okay why is he running after it even that man doesn't know and as solomon looks at people like that their hard work their toil their saving things for the future when they die what where will it go who is it will be why are they so much worked up through life why are they not enjoying their life why are they not using it when they can that's the thought that was there which was driving him crazy okay uh, he talked about uh, the grievous evil under the sun wealth that is hoarded and wealth that is lost hoarded for no one's benefit people stack money in the swiss banks okay and they hide money they have looted in uh, some place in another place they don't use it okay and they don't give it to anyone hoarding of money and others whom catastrophes and disasters have made them beggars and paupers overnight okay uh, in exodus 515 we are told everyone comes naked from their mother's womb and as everyone comes so they depart they take nothing from their toil that they carry into uh, in their hands as everyone comes so they depart okay so all this mad uh, driving so he, he looks at our birth when we come we come naked no garments no jewels no many of us don't even hair have hair at that time okay so we are born without anything then we try to gather lot of things then when we die we go without anything okay so solomon is telling trying to remind us that it looks like all these belong to someone else the creator okay who gives it for your use for a short period of time then why are we you know so much worked up about gathering more and more of it more and more of it and uh, like you know losing uh, our life okay uh, people are not happy that is the next point that he talks about 
uh, people wanted change. They wanted Solomon to go. They, when the next one comes, they, they look for youth to replace the old, okay? And then when the youth come, when they have spent some more time in that position, others want those people also to go. So he says, like, you know, what is this craving for change that the world has? Okay, chapter 4, verses 15 uh, to 16. Then we will quickly look at, the. this is uh, what Solomon talked about life, the meaninglessness of the things that are happening on the earth especially if we don't look at it from God's perspective. This is what life is, transient, meaningless, worth, worthless, okay? And every pursuit produces nothing, okay? There are people who have uh, become very wealthy, like Solomon. You know, in our recent times, we know of uh, Jay Lalita, chief minister of Tamil Nadu, then uh, Dhirubhai Ambani, uh, then uh, so many others who became very wealthy and died. They, we know they all left everything and they went, okay? None of them carried uh, what they have. Recently, Dinakaran, uh, you know, Paul Dinakaran's uh, wealth was raided and uh, uh, hundreds of crores of unaccounted cash, they say, was found. We don't know. Uh, the courts will decide later on, but as of now. We also know on the other side, people like John Wesley. I'm sure we have all heard about him, the famous preacher who started the Methodist Church, okay? Uh, when he died, uh, he had only uh, one set of clothes apart from the pair of clothes that he was wearing, okay? And he had few cents of money uh, that he had saved up so that uh, it could be given to those who would carry uh, his uh, coffin, okay? Uh, but though he left not much money because that is how he lived and used all the money that came to him uh, uh, in the expansion of God's kingdom, he prepared several sermons as he traveled on horseback, okay, uh, on when he was riding on the horseback itself. It is said that, you know, uh, if you calculate the mileage that uh, John Wesley traveled in his lifetime, uh, going from village to village preaching, it would equal at least 10 circuits of the entire earth, you know, going around the globe 10 times. That was what he did. So though he had no money to leave, behind, he left behind what is today a 30 million strong Methodist church, okay? Uh, uh, a life that was utilized uh, in a meaningful way as against the meaningless accumulation of wealth and uh, meaningless lifestyle which others have. Then very quickly, in the next six, seven minutes, I will uh, try to bring to our notice uh, a few thoughts which Solomon says must not escape from our minds as recorded in the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? Uh, the very first thing is in verse 5 of chapter 11. You can't understand God's ways completely, okay? Obviously, God is infinite. God is eternal. Uh, he can, he is omniscient. He knows everything, okay? And there is no way we can comprehend and understand him. So his methodology, the way he works, the way he deals with things, we will not be able to manage to understand, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, on our own, in chapter 8, verse 17, he says, we cannot understand the meaning of life, okay? So this is something that we must remember. Then the next thing he talks about, we must remember, is that on the earth, there is a time for everything. A time to be born, a time to die, okay? A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, okay? Time to plant, time to uproot, okay? Many things he tells. God has ordained it, and we should know it, and... Uh, we cannot go out of bounds, okay? You cannot be born before your time. You cannot die earlier than your time. There's a time to be born, a time to die, okay? And uh, we live within a fixed span of time that God has assigned for us, okay? This is something that should be an awesome thought. We don't have an eternity on the earth, okay? Uh, we need, we are confined in space and time. In the book of Acts, we are told that we were born at a particular location so that in that location, we may seek God and find him, okay? So uh, this time, space uh, that God has given us is particularly his gracious provision for us. 
the best possible time uh, in earth time when uh, we could live and know him and where our life can turn from being meaningless into something meaningful and uh, worthwhile okay then uh, the third thing that uh, solomon uh, wants us to know strongly is that no one has power over the time of his death chapter 8 verse 8 it talks about death being a common destiny for all and that we have no power over the time of death we attempt to postpone it by putting people on respirators by giving them oxygen by giving them ventilators by giving them heart lung machines uh, by feeding them manually uh, you know intravenously you know we do a lot of things to keep a person alive but we can't the day the minute the the exact moment at which we will be recalled from this earth it will be a recall we will go okay uh, in spite of whatever wealth we may have nothing can stop us okay then the fourth thing that uh, solomon wants us to know is that we have uh, god has set eternity in our hearts chapter 3 verse 11 uh, i'll just read it for you He has made everything beautiful in his time. Okay. So God makes everything beautiful in his time. Okay. There's a time for everything. That is what Solomon had said. And there's a time in which God is making everything beautiful. He has also set eternity in the hearts of, uh, in the human heart. Okay. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Okay. Uh, this is the thought. God has, Billy Graham talked about how, there is a God-shaped vacuum in each of our hearts, okay? Only God can fill that empty space, okay? That eternity which he has set within you. And uh, it is important for us to realize what God has said. Of all the creatures that are alive on the earth, only the human beings think about their future, think about eternity. And we are worried about it. And we are worried about the outcome of what will happen uh, in eternity. Okay. Uh, the fifth thing is uh, that uh, Solomon wants us to know is given in chapter 3 verse 15. God will call the past into account. God will call the past into account. That means uh, the life that we live on the earth, uh, we must live it in such a way, remembering that at some point of time, there will be a, a recall, a recollection, and an accounting that we need to do before God. God will uh, call the past into account. We cannot escape it, what we have done, what we did yesterday, what we did day before yesterday, the, the, the things that we stole, the things that we lied about, the things that we, the adulterous thoughts that we entertained, you know, every single thing, the pornographic things that we have looked at, whatever it may be, or the greed or covetousness that we had, the jealousies that we had, the hatred that we had, the unforgiving heart that uh, we had, you know, God will call the past into account, okay? Then the sixth thing that he wants us to know is there in verse 14. Uh, I uh, will bring every deed into judgment, chapter 3, verse 14 every deed into judgment, including hidden things, whether good or evil. Okay. Uh, then uh, we are told uh, about our life in chapter 9, verse 4 to 6. Anyone who is living has a hope. A living dog is better than a dead li lion. Okay. That means uh, the condition in which we are, you know, whatever may be our situation that has turned us turned our lives miserable, makes us feel meaningless, you know. Uh, but with that God-shaped vacuum, when we feel the emptiness and hollowness of our life, then we must remember that we, in the land of the living, are the ones with a hope. When we die, that hope is gone. What we can do about setting things right with God, mending relationships with God, that is possible only when we are alive okay then uh, it continues by saying that the dead know nothing there is no further reward that they have even their name is forgotten their hates their loves their jealousy everything is vanished they have no part 
in life on earth. So the dead can't return back. There is no reincarnation of the dead. There is no annihilation of the dead as well. Okay, You will live for eternity, but that eternity will be at the end of the accounting that Solomon talked about when God calls your life into account. So better be ready for that. That is what uh, Solomon says. Then the eighth thing uh, that he wants us to do, remember, is in chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before you are dead, in other words. Okay? So when you have life on earth, you know, when that emptiness comes, confronts you day after day, when you are fed up with the studies that you do, when you are fed up with the job that you are doing, you are fed up with the mundane things in life, you are fed up with the wealth that you have, with the possession that you have, you know, it is God gnawing at your heart to make his presence felt. Remember him. That is what Solomon says. When it is possible, when you are alive, because a living dog is better than a dead lion. You know, you may have been anything on the earth, but after you are dead, you can do nothing about it. Okay? Then the last thing he wants us to do in verse 13 of chapter 12, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the duty of all mankind. Okay? Uh, fearing God, having a relationship with him, remembering to seek his mind for understanding his purpose for our life. Okay? And understanding the futility of all that is there on the earth is what Solomon wants us to know and uh, give up. So, uh, life of Solomon serves as a warning, okay? And he has written down his testimony so that we may not follow in the path that he trod, okay? Wisdom will not give you meaning in life. Hard work will not give you meaning in life. Women, wealth, clothes, servants, music, you know, nothing will bring uh, change that emptiness that you have and give meaning to it, okay? That empty heart, that eternity that he set in your heart will keep gnawing at you till you turn yourself into the hands of the living God. He will call your entire life into account, okay? And you will have to give an account of it unless you set that sin problem in your life right, okay? And submit yourself to God the creator when you have time and life on your hands, okay? Everything else will be futile, okay? This is what we are called to do. This is what Solomon understood. And this is what Solomon wrote, looking at the rear view of uh, the mirror of his life, looking at his whole life. And he understood that many of the things that he had done were useless. It is very tragic for a human being. You know, we all have a span of life. It will be the most tragic thing if we realize uh, that everything that we are doing is useless and vanity and we have spent all our life doing that which was useless and meaningless and not done that which was essential, that is turning our hearts to God and living the way he wants us to live. You know, in the parable of the rich fool, our Lord called the rich man who had got a big bumper harvest he tore down his old barns, which was small, too small to hold uh, the crops that uh, had been harvested, built big barns, decided that he will enjoy life. And then he heard the voice of God. You fool, tonight your life is required of you. Who will be there to enjoy what you have saved? Okay. So this is the outcome of the kind of life that we live if we pursue that way. This is not just that of a secular person. Solomon uh, uh, was not uh, a secular person in that sense, no, someone who did not know the Lord. He offered so many sacrifices. His heart was devoted to God. But when he pursued, after knowing him, a wrong way of life, his life became meaningless. His life became vanity. His life became fleetingly useless. and. This is the message that he has left for us, lest we follow in the path that he had drawn. Uh, we uh, will end. Uh, request uh, Brother Shaji Matthew to take.